afternoon. I'm Dan Diamond, a health reporter at the Washington Post, and welcome to Aspen Ideas Health and this conversation. I should say, just a word of warning, this is my first time moderating in person in more than two and a half years, so I, I may just be a little bit rusty. I'm gonna have to try and remember that I don't have to unmute myself before asking <laughs> questions. I'm, I'm also just a little bit sniffly, but it's not COVID, so forgive me for that too. I would now like to introduce my, uh, my panel or panelist, a woman who needs very little introduction, Dr. Deborah Burks. Thank you, glad to be here. I, I know you all applauded, but I still have to do the introduction. So she's Make it a, really short. <laughs> she is an HIV AIDS expert. She led PEPFAR across multiple administrations. She served as the nation's first coronavirus coordinator. She's also the author of a memoir, Silent Invasion, about her time in the Trump White House leading the COVID response. Dr. Burks, welcome to Aspen Ideas Health. I would like to talk about your time in the Trump administration working on COVID, but thought maybe we could start with more recent developments just get a sense for what's been going on with you. When we last spoke a week ago, you had told me you had not gotten COVID yet through two years plus of the pandemic, through traveling to multiple states, working in the Trump White House, which was in some ways a hot zone. It was, what, <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> what is your secret? How have you avoided COVID? So, um, I'm a very common sense person, so I do common sense things that I know I can follow. And so um, I wore my surgical mask in the White House um, throughout those early days. And then when masks became available, I upgraded. I have these in many colors. This is my social mask. So I wear my KN95 socially. I wear my N95 hair up on top of the head, round the head. And 95 anytime I'm on in airports or on airplanes and I don't take it off. It makes it a little difficult not to eat and drink, but um, I don't. And no one in our immediate family, I have too many people with really huge vulnerabilities and we have that across the whole family. So I not only had to keep myself safe, I had to keep all the nieces and nephews safe. So I send like a monthly this is what you need to do this month. So it's very mass driven and very testing driven. And we all kind of do the same thing. So I, I have to ask, we are in a county that according to the CDC is high transmission level for COVID. I've been here for a few days, seen very few people wearing masks indoors. Yeah. Should you and I even be here having this conversation? <laughs> well, I did check the ventilation a bit. I would rather there weren't those curtains, but you know, it is what it is, you try to make two. Um, so I think it's a matter of managing the degree of risk. So if there's things you really wanna do, I've gone to weddings um, and I've been at weddings, but they've moved my table outside, which was very kind. Um, but I haven't limited myself socially, I just do mask when I'm in these kind of places and it, it's worked. Um, there is outdoor transmission though with this new variant. And that is a little bit concerning. The reason I can say that definitively is 100% of the family members hadn't been infected until three weeks ago. And I told my daughter, this is, you know, she, we've been very careful. And I said to her, outside is so safe. No, get those three, get that three-year-old and four-year-old in swim lessons. Um, and we got, she gets a text Saturday morning um, her swim coach that had a lesson with each of them, a private lesson, so her three and a four year old turned COVID positive. And within 20, 48 hours that night, they were already positive. Exposure was Thursday, they were. That was their only exposure. So it can happen, but you know, swimming and you don't have swimmers, you're in their face, because you have to, you can't let the child drown. So <laughs> the, the swim instruction was very close. So, I mean, if you're really close to someone outside, you can probably get B4, B5. Well, uh, uplifting comments at the beginning <laughs> of our conversation. But, but let's take it beyond your family and talk about where we are nationally. Yes. Infections are still running rampant two plus years into yeah. the pandemic. And for those who say infections cases don't matter anymore, we're looking at deaths. There's still about 10,000 Americans dying per month from COVID. How do you And it will go back up within the next four weeks, yeah. So you think we're at a lower ebb right now? Well, okay, so what happens is the Northeast and the upper Midwest has lots of people. 
And so when they have a little bit of a swell, which we did last year with the alpha variant, so just really quickly, every variant that has started in South Africa, and I'm not saying it started in South Africa, but they're extraordinarily good at sequencing. So they identify all their variants, unlike the United States, and then you can watch that variant come to Europe, and 100% of the variants that went from South Africa to Europe, and UK, excellent sequencers, it gets here within four to six weeks. So what you are seeing in the upper Northeast and the upper Midwest was the, the equivalent of the B, B1, B2 variant. Um, and so those cases are going down and the hospitalizations in the Northeast and upper Midwest are going down. But B4, B5 is expanding across the South where it's very hot and people are going indoors. And so what you're seeing now is, is and this is why I always call it tyranny of averages because it, it makes you feel good that you're seeing cases going down, but it's hiding the fact that they're going up very rapidly in the South and hospitalizations are going up very rapidly in the South. But because there's less people in the South, um, people get reassured in the Northeast and go, oh, well, things are good now. Things are getting better in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, and the summer will be fine there, more li most likely, depending on how outdoor transmission of B4, B5 is. But the South is in for a very rough time. You're describing disturbing trends, trends that are going not where we want them to go. Yes. You led the coronavirus response. How do you think the current coronavirus response team is doing? Are they doing well? So in some, you know, it's hard to be perfect. So in some places they have done very well. Um, and what do, I, what do I mean by that? I mean they have gotten to the low hanging fruit. So when you combat a pandemic, you've got to worry about everyone, not just the easy to reach. And so both with vaccines and now with the test and treat strategy, We've done great with the easy to reach. And, and just to be specific, who are the easy to reach? Well, if you live in a metro area, you are easy to reach because they put Paxlovid at every CVS. But if you live in rural Colorado, if you live in northern Texas, if you live in, in upper Mississippi, Alabama, Louisiana, there are no primary care doctors and there's no CVSs or Walgreens. There's dollar stores. So, you know, we're not, we've done the easy, we're not doing the hard, and we didn't do the hard for the vaccines, and now we're not doing the hard for the proactive testing and Paxlovid that saved a lot of people in the Northeast. I mean, the fatality rates were much better for the first time. Vaccines improved the fatality rates, Paxlovid improved it again. In, in your view, why are we not doing the hard? Why are we not reaching those rural Americans that you mentioned? Because we don't have a national goal that's then um, create, so I've run pandemic programs around the globe. In order to be successful, you have to know what you want to achieve. <laughs> so we had a goal that UN AIDS stepped for us, and that's the big um, UN group that works on AIDS, and they, their goal was no HIV infections and no HIV deaths, full stop. If you start with that premise, and then you take that from the national level to the state level to the county level to the local community level, and everybody knows that what they're trying to achieve, and you're looking for who's doing it well mm -hmm. so you can learn from them and who needs more help so you can help improve them, that's what a federal program should be doing every day. So simply, what should the goal be at this moment when COVID is still spreading and you expect it to go up? What is the goal that you think we should have? I think our goal should be zero hospitalizations and zero deaths. Is that achievable, realistically? Well, if you don't start with perfect, then you settle on, I mean, I can't believe there were people having a discussion on whether, as a community, we would find 300 deaths a day acceptable. You're referencing a recent article on this, <laughs> yeah. which, which I that's, should say White House officials not, have denied, but. Well, you can't start from that premise. You have to start from, that would be like saying, well, we're just gonna accept a certain percentage of people with Hodgkin's disease are gonna die. So, you know, if we don't, we wouldn't do those special, so there's common treatment, and then there's, there's the second generation, and then there's salvage treatment. Well, we wouldn't even work on salvage treatment, because we would say, well, we're just gonna accept that 10 or 15% of people aren't gonna live. We've never approached medicine like that. And I, to me, you don't, I sometimes people believe within public health that it's less. 
You should never accept less in public health. You just figure out how to do it at the po population level. Seems to have struck a chord. I don't accept what? less. Don't. It may have looked like that at times, but you weren't inside, so I am not a less acceptor. Well, let's get to that. Let's get to your time inside. You were in Congress yesterday, giving yes. testimony in front of a House panel that had been probing. That's why I couldn't be here with all this fun stuff. I, I will say you were dressed a little differently when you presented to Congress than at Aspen. I did wear a lot of floral, though. <laughs> I, I really enjoy your pants, as I was saying earlier. <laughs> the, the testimony that you gave was in front of the House panel that has probed the coronavirus response. In addition to your testimony, yeah. you sat with that committee last October. They finally released hundreds of pages of transcripts, which I read. And, uh, wow, it, that was a lot. It's my job to follow you. <laughs> the New York Times wrote a story based on something you said in the transcript, not, not yesterday. Yeah. But on the reports you were doing regularly, sending to governors, you told the panel that you were forced to make changes, essentially. If you wanted these reports to go out, you had to make changes about 25% of the time. Can you be more specific about what those changes were? So, um, so just to go back on the reporting, so when I came into the White House, and for all of you in the audience, I had never met anyone in the White House before. I knew Matt Pottinger because I knew his wife. This is the National the Security. National, Deputy National Security Advisor. And I had had the Vice President do one AIDS event for me. But he walked in, talked on stage, and left. So I have no relationships with anybody in the White House. I'm really what they would refer to as a bureaucrat, and that's usually not in a pleasant way. You're a civil servant. Yeah. Like government civil servant. <laughs> you know, we're the ones that are trying to block everything they're trying to do. That's how they were perceived in general. So from the very beginning, because I could see this coming, and it's why I came back from, to, from Africa to work in the White House, is I. I wanted a daily report, so I wrote a daily report to everybody on the task force and all the senior advisors in the White House and about three or four of the cabinet secretaries because I wanted them to see the reality of what was happening across the country um, down to the county level. And in June, we started writing um, weekly reports for the governors because the governor's health staff, first, I want to say this, there isn't a governor, I saw 44 governors um, well, actually, I saw all 50 plus and all the territory leadership. But you traveled. But to I meet traveled the to 44 right? governors to meet with them in person. And they some were of them multiple your, times. They were relying on your advice yeah. and perspective, your national perspective. But they have tiny teams, so being able to write a report that says, "This is what I found working here," I think it could work there. Here's the team to contact, and I put all the data together and. So the whole, it was about eight to 10 pages. So it was a summary of what was happening in their state and a summary of recommendations that were, of course, completely opposite of what the president was saying. But all of June, July, August, September, they didn't stop me. I mean, I'm writing about closing bars, <laughs> and, you know, during a surge. Not when there's not a surge, but when, during a surge. And remember, we had to do things then that we don't have to do now because we didn't have vaccines and we didn't have Paxlovid. So, I mean, there are things you have to do when you have nothing. We had nothing but remdesivir, which was only an inpatient treatment. So, writing to the governors, the governors in person are asking me to say these things because some of them have Republican legislatures. So when this report comes and says, you should put in a mass mandate, they go to their Republican legislature and said, see, this is coming from the Republican White House. I just want to pause and, and underline that point. So what you're saying is you were giving cover for what might yes. be unpopular public health yes. measures because it was coming from the Trump White House. Correct. So those were some of the recommendations you were making. And then yes. they started to be So clear. then they started finding them. They had someone actually read them. I have to say, so great, I don't think anybody read them. <laughs> all of June, July, August, September in the White House. So then the election starts coming. And then I think some governors are calling in and saying these recommendations are too aggressive. So they come to me and say to change the recommendations. And sorry, who's they? Who's coming to you? So Mark Meadows, I'm not Mark Meadows, Mark Short's team. The chief of staff um, to the, the chief vice of president. staff to the vice president. I don't think the vice president ever knew that what his chief of staff was doing. And so th they would read them all 50 reports on a Sunday and get back to me with these changes. But then I realized um, that they were skimming. 
So as long as I didn't start the bullet with close bars, <laughs> decrease indoor dining, they missed it. So we just kept, but I've learned that working with presidents and prime ministers around the globe. I mean, they can't pay attention to everything you're doing, and there's a real benefit in that. So your secret was burying yes. the advice. So it would start, the, par the bullet would start with something like, um, it would be about nursing homes. Um, because they, they were always, always, they never asked me to change any, so I learned what they were changing and not changing, and then I would just put that as the comma, you need to close your bars. So just, just so I understand, because the original reporter was kind of vague, what actually got changed, was it that specific advice yes. that you wanted to Yes, it would say you have to remove closing bars, reducing indoor dining. And you would remove that at times? And we would just move it. You, so you would move it, but not remove it? Correct. All of the advice that you wanted stayed in the report? Yes. Now, there were four of us writing 50 reports, so that was my 12. Some of the other three were less, and I was like, come on. So we would have a call then on Sunday and say, if you're asked to do this, put it there. And so we were able to do that. Is it so most of the recommendations stayed whole. I would say by November, they were even getting more dramatic about what they didn't want in the report. Um, and it was very interesting, because governors, I would code your, the state, and a governor would call and say, I am not red. And I'm like, oh, yeah, you're red. <laughs> and he goes, no, 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 I am, I have a test positivity of 9.9. .9. And I said, well, I have 10.1. Um, and I said, if it's really 9.9 .9 and going down, you're yellow next week, so why do you care? I mean, it was just crazy. But closer we got to the election, governors really cared what the report said. One more report question, or, or maybe one and a half more questions. Again, I'm a little rusty doing this live. <laughs> there were headlines yesterday about this revelation saying that your reports have been watered down. Is that accurate? No. It's not accurate. No, because I just moved the recommendations. I mean, yes, they asked me to water them down, um, but I didn't. I think the biggest change and the most dramatic change came in December, actually, after the election, which I never could understand. Um, and they said, well, we're not going to send them out anymore. Now, I just want you to grasp this. The White House, with the White House emblem on it, is sending this report to governors every week that says completely the opposite of what the president is saying. And they've sent out over 50, over 30 of them. And then in December they said, okay, we're not sending them out anymore, governors have to ask for them. That was the biggest water down is, um, and obviously there were governors then who didn't ask for them. Th th this is my half question, I think. <laughs> You're talking about these reports that were being sent privately and occasionally would be leaked to the press, sometimes in ways that came back. Well, Andy Bashir's put his up every week. This is the Kentucky governor. Yes, yes. <laughs> he did. And it was awesome. Some Kentucky residents over there. Um, the and I had national pieces in there, so I would call him and say thank you, because the whole the whole U.S. was in the back of the report. Yeah. Who was opposing the efforts to make them public? Was that also Mark Short? No, that was. I, I would say that that was almost all the senior advisors didn't want this public. And so what we decided to do um, is my little teeny tiny data team, um, we secretly put up the HHS community report in December after they told us that we couldn't, they weren't gonna let the gov, where it wasn't automatically going to the governors, that the governors had to request it. So then we shifted it all to a online at hhs.gov, it is still there today, and all of the back reports. Um, um, but it doesn't include recommendations, but it's the entire country. It's revised about two to three times a week. It's still being revised by the Biden administration. So HHS community profile um, COVID. And you can see precisely what's happening in your county. I've noticed in, in listening to you today, in your testimony, hearing previous comments you've made, you can be very critical of Mark Short, of Scott Atlas, who emerged as essentially your rival in the White House because you would say, to President Trump, things that Trump wanted to hear, even though Dr. Atlas. And provide him data that the president wanted to see. It, you know, it was more, I mean, it was, yeah. Data that was wildly different from yes. what you were seeing. Dr. Atlas, you said yesterday to the House panel, 
had dangerous ideas, pushing That was in an email. Government employees also know how to create a, it was historic, so I was, I, there is a lot in emails. So when those emails all get released, all 100, 200,000 of them, I mean, you know, people will really be able to see what was really going on. I, None of them are classified, so you can get them in exactly three and a half years to write the comprehensive book. Or if someone would like to share them with a reporter ahead of time. I, <laughs> they I took all of mine. I had them so well. I just had extra copies, and I have them all by month um, with all the handouts. Um, and there's 25 banker boxes at the National Archives. So, so just to put a little context around this, there was an August 2020 email. You had an Oval Office yes. meeting with Dr. Atlas and President Trump. Dr. Atlas is arguing for less testing, essentially. And you, you told the House Committee this was a dangerous well, he rewrote the guidelines. I mean, not only was he in there, and I, I just want to be very clear. The president only gave me one policy in April. And he said, you know, after we did the 15 days to slow the spread and the 30 days to slow the spread and the reopening criteria, he said to me, one line, we will never shut the country down again. Well, that's what I operated on under the entire time because he never came back, despite the fact that Scott Atlas would say, well, the president's policy is. And I'm like, have the president tell me. Have the president tell me that's his policy. Because you know it's like that all the time. I'd be working overseas and they would say, oh, the minister of health said this. I'm like, have the minister of health come and say that to me. So the president never came back to me and ever changed his policy. And so that was the one policy I operated on. But I wanted to make sure that things were documented exactly what Dr. Atlas had said in these meetings. And so even though they only showed point one and point seven, there were nine points I, I will just in say, the email. I've spoken with Dr. Atlas before. He has his own book about his time in the yes. administration. The two of you tell very different stories, fair to say. But Which is that's why I wrote the emails. You, you do have some emails that catch in real time. But again, just bringing it to, to a broader point, you have been very critical of other advisors and officials who you say misled the president. I'm not sure I've heard you be as directly critical of President Trump, even though he has parroted what Dr. Atlas has said. I'm very critical in the book as far as what technical things he did wrong. Now, now understand, I am not in those meetings where they're talking about political things, because I'm not a political person. They would never have trusted me in those meetings. So I was in sanitized meetings, not meetings with senior officials and staff. I'm sure they had a whole set of meetings that I never knew about. Um, but in those, I make it very clear that the reason we had the problems that still, some of which linger today, is when you have nothing in a pandemic, which we had in HIV, we had nothing in the early AIDS pandemic. And remember, it took us four years to even identify the virus and to develop a test. So we didn't have a test to 84. We didn't even have the first drug to 89. So Tony and I and Bob had lived that. We had Tony lived. Tony Fauci, Robert Redfield. Yes, we had lived the horror of not having anything. When you have nothing then, doctors and patients will try anything. And I think, but the one thing you have is empathy and communication. And I feel like from the very beginning, we underplayed the, what you could see as a tsunami wave that was coming to the shores of the United States. And I think that put us on the wrong foot to begin with. That wrong foot continued. That miscommunication continued. And when you only have someone's voice, that becomes the most critical component of the pandemic response. Just, just to ask a direct question, you say Dr. Atlas is dangerous. Was President Trump dangerous too? In that communication piece, absolutely. President Trump was a dangerous communicator. Exactly. Was he dangerous exactly. in any other way? I don't know. I mean, obviously, we're all seeing the news. You, you saw more than most? <laughs> I wasn't in those discussions about the election, but I can tell you that the COVID discussions look remarkably like, and the pressure that everybody was under looks remarkably like what the Department of Justice was under. That is what the task force, and that's what the, the HHS pressure, 
and Steve Hahn and Bob Redfield and others, including myself, were under. So that type of behavior was not unique to COVID, and you can see it in the election piece, and it was identical in COVID. I've and that's why I didn't spend a lot of time on that in the book, because one, I mean, how many times do we have to say the same thing? So let's, let's turn to the book, Silent Invasion, which I've read. I've tried to read every book by former Trump officials about the coronavirus. Yeah, I've, that's what I hate. I'm not a Trump official. Well, and it's you not a in memoir. The Trump, you, you, it is a book about the pandemic of what went wrong, what went right, and what we need to fix today. You were in the Trump White House. You wrote about your time in the Trump White House. Yes. But you know, if you keep doing this, I, what I worry about, and the reason I keep pushing back on that, is because we have a lot of bureaucrats in the federal government, and they're really dedicated people. I mean, really, really dedicated people. And I knew, I mean, I, you know, those of us who've been in government a long time, I knew if I went in that White House, it was gonna be a terminal event for my federal career. I, I mean, I... It was going to be the end of your federal career. Totally. Um, I wasn't gonna wait for them to fire me, but I was a CDC, um, I was on the CDC payroll. I mean, that was my mothership, that I, was my agency. Just, just a quick question, you accepted this role in the White House as COVID coordinator. There have been two since, Jeff Zients, yeah. Ashish Jha. They are truly political. They're political, but yeah. you weren't political. No, I was a bureaucrat that was brought in to try to fix things. And what I worry about is if you lump someone who has spent lifetimes working with every president in with political operatives, you're not gonna get people to go in and do that again. You just won't. And so if you keep putting me in the category as Kellyanne Conway or people who wrote their memoirs, I, well, I actually, wrote this to fix the pandemic. I was about to give you a compliment I, <laughs> before we went, went down this cul-de-sac. I just worry about our people. Federal workers are really wonderful human beings who wanna help every day. There is a lot of great work by federal workers, and your book, which was one of several I've read, yes. was quite comprehensive, I thought, the most comprehensive, because you saw so much of the pandemic, as opposed to someone like Dr. Atlas, who joined later. And I was out in the field. And you talk about your efforts observing from afar when you were working on PEPFAR, the HIV AIDS program. So having, having read your book, I, I just wanna check this with you. Do you think it's fair to say you had about five weeks of direct influence on President Trump, February, March, then in April, you March, follow up. April. I didn't get there till March 2nd. So, so March into April. Early April, you fall out of favor, and the rest of your time is essentially indirectly trying to influence the response. Is that fair? Yes, and I think, you know, the, the other reason I wrote the book is you don't, you don't write governor's reports, you don't go to 44 states without people inside the White House helping you every day. Um, and so there was a whole team that, did a, probably a couple hundred local TV and radio spots for me in between my visits so I could stay in touch with the communities based on what I had seen. They were setting that all up. And they knew what I was saying. I mean, they, they sat there while I was saying it. So they knew that I was saying the opposite of President Trump, yet they facilitated all of that. And I, I'm still shocked because I was not one of them yet people believed me and helped me. And I think, I mean, you see that now in the, the commission, the January 6th commission, but there were a lot of people helping. Um, when I went to the communications leads and I said, you can't put Scott Atlas out. You know, I can't stop him from talking to the president, but I can stop him being on national news. And they said, okay. So he, he had to book his, all of his own TV spots. That's how he ended up on Russian TV. There was, there was quite a behind the scenes push yeah. between you and Dr. Atlas later in the year. I'm actually curious about one event that was new to me in your book. You reflected on, it was, uh, let me just check my notes, March 24th. Yes. President Trump spoke on Fox News. The country had already, he was listening to you at that point. The country had moved towards social distancing, shutting down, but President Trump said he wanted to reopen the country, uh, quote, raring to go by Easter, that he wanted to see, quote, packed churches. This was about two weeks later. You yeah. wrote in the book, this was privately troubling because you realized the serious risks to Americans if President Trump followed through. But on March 25th, the next day, 
you went on the Christian Broadcasting Network and praised President Trump, and I quote, uh, he has been so attentive to the scientific literature and the details and the data. I think his ability to analyze and integrate data that really comes out of his long history in business has been a real benefit during these discussions. I could go yes, on. Yes, thank God. Thank God. And this is the problem. I know you want to make people into villains and victims and black and white. Um, but I can tell you, when I got there and started presenting my data, now remember, this was a country saying it was like the flu, and we were going to contain the virus, and everything was going to be fine. That, was, that defines our January and February. Within, two week, well, within the first week, based on the data from Europe, he closed to Europe. Within two weeks, he put out this 15 days to slow the spread, which allowed every governor then to actually put in very significant. And the reason we had to do that is because I was following the Italy data, and if we had had our largest 25 metros go down the way New York City did, we, we had nothing. We had 12,000 ventilators. I mean, we couldn't let that happen. And so he was actually, and I still to this day don't know why, was using and using my data to set policy. I was thrilled, because I didn't think that was going to happen. So I would say it again. He used the data again for the 30 days to slow the spread. And then, well, it's in the book. He, the CEA, his economics team, told him that I had lied to him. And when I said 100,000 to 240,000 people were going to die, it was really only going to be 26,000 in their analysis. And in that moment, I mean, I think he felt incredibly betray betrayed. I mean, I think he thought I was making up the numbers. Now, if you're a data person, you're, the only thing you have is your number to integrity. So, you know, people that work on data don't make up numbers. I mean, we just don't. It's, it's so unethical. So if President Trump was as good with data as you said he was on TV, yeah. why did he trust the bad data and not your data? Because, so here's the problem. If you have three senior epidemiologists, one from Oxford, one from Harvard, and you have Scott Atlas and someone from UCLA You're who are all- the great Barrington Doctrine folks. Yes. Who pushed for- Who are sending him their data. So I am sure that March 24th pronouncement came from that team sending him the data, saying there's no reason to do any of this stuff. And so, you know, it's very, I can't, that is, I've witnessed this over and over again in Sub-Saharan Africa. You know, when someone has a predilection to do something the opposite of what is needed, and then you give them that data and you are, okay, let's be honest. I went to um, Penn State for medical school. Um, as President Trump has said, I don't have a lot of clothes because I was a civil servant. That was his last tweet. <laughs> I missed that one. Yeah, but. she doesn't have a lot of dresses. <laughs> I'm like, okay. So now I just wear pants to just nudge that along. Um, but, I mean, here I have a civil servant. I haven't done anything in industry. I haven't made lots of money. And then there's this Stanford, Harvard, Oxford scientist telling him that Debbie Bergs has it completely wrong. I, you felt outgunned. Well, that you are sort of outgunned. Now, I'm not outvoiced. And, you know, that's, I think that's, that has always been my take home me message. As a woman in science, I am always outgunned. Um, but you just don't allow yourself to be outvoiced. In the book, you write about your pride in not leaking to reporters. I think Mark Meadows even confronted you at one point about a leak. You're like, I never leak. But in retrospect, do you wish you had taken more of your criticisms, either privately to reporters or even publicly? voiced these things that you're writing in the book at the time? You know, I, I knew I was sending all of this, all the things to Tony and... Tony Fauci? Yeah, Tony Fauci. Each of us had our own role. Um, his role really was to be our task force voice. Um, I trusted him to do that. I gave him all of the data. He got a morning summary, and he used that. And he also had a good Rolodex of reporters. Um, so I, I know everything that I was writing was getting to the reporters through Tony. I just, I'm just going to be frank. When you're buried in the data, and I, 
this is gonna sound a little hokey, data speaks to me, but I have to be in that moment. I have to be in the data. And so if I get distracted about a reporter saying this about you or a reporter saying that about you and, I'm, and I think for a moment of integrating data to how to protect myself, then I'm not doing my job. Mm. And so I just, I just trusted Tony explicitly. We had known him, I had known Tony for 40 years. I, I believe that he was getting the information out in real time. Speaking of Dr. Fauci, Jerome Adams, the former Surgeon General who, who worked in the Trump administration, who I, I think I saw here at Aspen, he has spoken up and said that you were treated unfairly in the press and public compared to Dr. Fauci, who offered similar advice as, as you. You were often on the same page. And just to quote a Jerome- We were always on the same page. You were always on the same page. <laughs> to quote a Jerome Adams tweet, I love Fauci, yet can't understand the reverence for him versus disdain for Burks. I'm curious if you agree with that, and if so, why do you think the two of you were uh, treated differently in public and the press? You know, I, it's not subtle. I mean, it was, I, you weren't in always in that White House briefing room, but I would present, I would spend 10 minutes talking about what was happening with all the data and graphs that I had personally created. We would finish it, Tony would get up and agree with my interpretation and always talk about something clinical because that's, to that's Tony's area. Tony is a biomedical treatment and vaccines and I'm an epi data analysis pandemic response person. So we each had our lanes. I would get done, Tony would get done. The reporters would only ask Tony questions about the data. Why do you think that was? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, and Jerome witnessed this over and over again. I, I mean, it's just. Do you think it was because of Tony's Rolodex? No, I, well, I don't know. I mean, I think that it, to me, what it said is, okay, this seems a little trivial, but to me it said, well, she made the pretty grass, but she doesn't really understand what they mean. Right? Yeah. I've been there 100,000 times. You know, that's, you know, the fact that people talk about my scarves and my clothes, I mean, really, I, but, you know, I really think people thought I was like the person who made the graphs, but I had no idea what they were saying. I mean, I had a thousand graphs. I picked the top six that I thought could communicate most effectively to the American people. I mean, that's what I considered my job to be. I think I did that job, but there was always this difference in how I was perceived and how Dr. Fauci was perceived. I. I don't understand it, but what I do understand one thing, the task force, the FEMA people, the Cardinals, the McKessons, they use that data that we created to save American lives. And so I don't really care how it happened, but it is discouraging, you know, that all these years into STEM, we think that women can't understand math and equations. We can. We can. You'll, you'll get no and all the young women things. out there, you can. But I know you'll be just, you can't be outvoiced. So just keep your guns. We're, we're getting to a point where I'd like to open it up to questions. I think there are some microphones roving. While the microphones are, are finding their way to hands, maybe one more question for me. Yeah. You, you have talked about, you just talked about the risks of being in the Trump White House, the perception that comes. You've now written this book. Some of the reviews and, and write-ups of the book have been pretty tough. The St. Louis Post-Dispatch had an editorial uh, calling your book uh, and, and discussion about it a, quote, cynical redemption tour because <laughs> yeah. you didn't speak out while in office. Yeah. Others, like Vanity Fair yeah, said yeah. the same. Yeah, but you know, the people who actually read the book, the New York Times, the Washington Post, um, and uh, others, actually said it's the most comprehensive, detailed account of what happened. And the reason I wrote it is so that we know what went wrong and what went right, so we can do the right better. Because I think there's extraordinary rights that happened in that first year. And that we carry that through so that, and I want to be very clear, what I end the book with is if we fix this current pandemic with clear goals, that we'll be ready for the next one. So stop spending money on pandemic preparedness, deal with this one, 
put the systems in place, the data systems, the actions related to the data systems, the integrated healthcare that needs to occur in our rural areas, fix that, and then we'll be ready. Because we're still not ready because we still have a number of people in rural areas without access to any healthcare. Let's turn to questions and two reminders. First, if you can say your name and affiliation. Second, it is a question, not a speech. Please go ahead. Sure. Adrian Billings, a rural family physician serving patients in those hard to reach areas that you spoke of on the Texas, rural Texas-Mexico border for my career. I really appreciate you mentioning and advocating for those rural areas. I really viewed that, that our profession, you and I's profession in medicine, we've, we've really failed um, our, our patients and our, our country by not being leaders and drivers of public health policy that's so needed. And I would love to get your thoughts on how do we as physicians and healthcare professionals with scientific integrity and the empathy and altruism that, that we all have in medicine, how do we become the drivers of policy and how do we, how do we influence the politicians um, to, to make the right choices that are in the betterment of our communities? Extraordinary point. And, I, I, and I'm going to start the answer by saying the reason I keep talking about tribal medicine in the book and spend a long time on rural health care is when I traveled this country and I drove with Iram Zaidi, my, my real epidemiologist, um, we drove to over 25,000 miles. I found places in this country that are worse than what I was able to create as a health system in Sub-Saharan Africa. Many places. And Where? I am committed. Our tribal, you go to tribal nations, the Shahoni tribes, it's inexcusable. I mean, it's inexcusable on a level that I will spend all the time that I have left dealing with this rural health and tribal nations piece because we let this happen. And we let it happen as physicians. And if I can give any voice to anything, it is that. And to really say, we have to do better. People are dying in counties that voted for Trump because they have been dying in those counties for the last two decades. This is nothing new. If you put up all-cause mortality from 10 years ago, it looks just like those counties today that are dying from COVID. There is no integrated health system anymore. What they promised us was hub and spoke into the big, you know, the big good hospitals. They get all the NIH money and all the technical money. And there are 22 level one trauma centers in the New York City area. There's one in Mississippi. And then we wonder what happened. And if you look at a map of access to level one or level two trauma, which is only an indication of really sophisticated health care. You know, that's where the ECMO machines are. That's where the ventilators are. If you look at that, the entire heartland and all of our rural southern states in the outside of the major cities are blank. They can't even get to those areas within 60 minutes, either by helicopter or ambulance. We let this happen. And I think every physician right now needs to be taken, and I'd love to help all of you, Take the data we have, integrate it into a package. That's what I presented yesterday um, to, the, to the committee. I spent the whole time on rural health care and why we were failing them. Um, and don't wait for your three or four public health people in your, in your state because they can't, they have, they're dealing with 100 things. And this is a substantive issue that needs to get right to the governor. I think you will find allies in the healthcare delivery system, because they can see it, and they know it. Um, when I was in Louisiana, I was in, and I just want to thank everybody. People left their homes and met with me in, at the height of the pandemic. And you know, we were all scared that first year. And they, they came in and met with me in person. And I was in a meeting at, in um, Baton Rouge. There's an Our Lady of Mercy Hospital, which is quite huge. Two of the community hospital lead physicians were there, and they said to me, you know, when we have a surge, the urban hospital fills up, and we can't get our patients in. None. They're dying in our community hospitals because we can't get them to Our Lady of Mercy. In the United States of America, I, 
I just don't find that acceptable. Having spent 20 years making sure that didn't happen in Sub-Saharan Africa for HID, TB, and malaria, and we fixed it, and I come home to this, and we let this happen, and I think, you know, this is, this is on us for everybody that's in the profession to shed light on this and to make it clear that we don't find it acceptable. Mm -hmm. Telehealth can help, but we need to be much more proactive in getting to those communities. And what do I mean? Getting them tests. We know everybody over 65 in this country. We know where they live. They're all registered. You're all registered because you filled out Social Security and Medicare. I, I would add just one thought, which is beyond the rural and, and tribal areas, there are many big city health systems that are world class and yet in the community. Yeah, right they at least have federally, health, federally qualified health clinics. And I just really want to thank the local community groups who set these up. So there are brick and mortar in many cities that were supported through HRSA. That's one of our um, agencies one within HHS. Agencies. Let's see if we can get through a couple more questions. I think there was a person right up here. Hi. Um, you were talking about the president and his influence. He was responsible for Operation Warp Speed, which got us yes. the vaccines. That's what I said. There's some things that were really good. And how come he doesn't get credit for that more? And how come? Uh, his supporters don't listen to him because he's been vaccinated and he talks about it today and they boo him. Yeah, so in the book I talk about not only Operation Warp Speed but um, the therapeutic work that went on that was part of Operation Warp Speed and that's why you have Paxlovid. All of these products were worked on in that first year, the Merck product, the Pfizer product, um, and of course the vaccines. But they also, the innovation in PPE was happening in parallel as well as what you just saw with formula. We created that in the early days of the um, response to fly in PPE and essential medicine from around the world. And so there, that's the kind of lessons that need to be codified for the future. And what worries me every day, um, I know that many people don't like what Governor DeSantos is doing, but Governor DeSantos figured out how to get monoclonal antibodies into everybody in the community by putting monoclonal antibody infusion sites in libraries. Yet, because someone didn't like him, we didn't act like that was a good idea. And let me tell you, people that you don't like have good ideas. Did, did, Governor, did Governor DeSantis do the right thing in opposing access to children's vaccines recently? No. So people are complicated. But that, yes, people are complicated. But if we don't, listen, I have learned, and I want to be very clear, I learned just as much from Republican governors as Democrat governors. I learned just as much from tribal chairmen that were leaving their communities as community activists in HIV. You have to, if we stop listening and seeing the importance of other people's ideas, we're screwed. I mean, and that's why, that's why it's not a memoir. It's not what Debbie Burks did in the White House. It's what I saw and what was good and what was bad. And the private sector, and I, I want to just make it very clear to you all, the private sector was incredible. Um, incredible. And a lot of people in federal government are like, oh, the private sector, they're just trying to make a profit. The private sector, when I told them on March 4th that we needed tests, we had tests within two weeks. Now just think of that, it happened in January. But we had tests within two weeks. And we not only had tests, every night Roche and Abbott sent me their data from every one of their machines around the world, around the United States, so that I could be able to go in the next day and say the test positivity rate at Columbia Hospital is 45%. This is only gonna get worse. And they did that, not, there was someone doing that as a job. They were working 24 hours, a, around the clock to get me what I asked for. They never said no. And then when we had such a shortage of PPE and we finally got the database up from every hospital, all 6,000 of them were reporting about their PPE needs. The major suppliers, Cardinal, McKesson, Henry Schein, all of these big stuff suppliers that bring the things to the hospitals, rearranged all of their supplies based on that data not on the basis of that hospital's ability to pay. And I don't think people give them, and that's, I really wanted people to see that. 
because there was so much good in America during that pandemic and so much good that is not brought to light today that makes us discouraged, I think, some days in our responses. Well, I think we are at time, so let me quickly paraphrase what, I, what I've heard today. People are complicated. You People can't, are complicated. You can't easily put political figures into the hero and villain category. That the approach- Even though we would like to. Well, it makes our lives simpler. Yes. There's but a it's lot of not gray. Disneyland out there. There's a lot of gray in the world, some in our hair too after the pandemic. <laughs> There is a real need to look forward and not just backwards on the pandemic, and that you did not write a memoir in your telling and you were not a Trump political official. So <laughs> those are some of the key takeaways from And the there's doctor. a lot of goodness and innovation in America. I, I, there really was. I mean, no one turned me away, except for South Dakota, but no one. <laughs> I'll ask you about that at the next panel. Dr. Deborah Brooks, thank you very much. Thank you.